Okay, this is Carol Merritt I'm at the Atlanta History Center, Thursday, September 8th, talking with Dr. Clinton Warner. This is our second session, and Dr. Warner is going to talk a little bit more about some of the experiences during the civil rights era. Um, and so, Dr. Warner, I welcome you this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, and one of the things that I wanted you to kind of review for me a little in a little more detail was some of the organizations that got started uh, in those early days in the 1960s. I remember in reading about the student uh, movement and um, the whole push, and there was something called the Atlanta Committee for Cooperative Action, uh, ACCA. Uh, do you remember that at all? I do remember ACCA, as you put it, the American Committee for Cooperative Action. That was a code name that this group placed upon itself, meaning that Atlanta, even during days of segregation, was noted for being a city too busy to hate, etc. And we do better. And the second look at Atlanta was designed to really look at it and point out flaws, things that needed to be corrected, and positions that need to be grown into in terms of humanity and human relationships that were woefully short in Atlanta, but I have to say better than in most places during that period of time. This had to be, this issue had to be around the time of the, before the time of the newspaper, I believe, Atlanta Inquirer, which was an outgrowth of the student movement, and is now a thriving and well-written uh, news organ in the city of Atlanta. But back to the point of the organizations. My particular, it was just, I read about them in the newspaper, to be perfectly frank. Different ones, different forms, different issues. But all my contact was mainly with people, and it didn't matter to me so much which organization it was. It didn't matter. Uh, so I'm not an expert on the existence of those organizations at the time. I've heard of all them, SNCC. I knew many of the members of it, uh, the leaders of it in this area, and uh, people like Julian Bond, etc. And I work with them. They, would they come to ask me something? Fine. It wasn't an organization. It was that person mm -hmm. that I trusted who had to be involved in those organizations. So I can't even name them all. Mm -hmm. And I'm that way now. I don't care a lot about organizations, but it's the people in them. There was one organization called the Student Adult Liaison Committee, evidently to try to bridge that gap between the students that had their own desire, their own strategy, and the adults who were a little bit more conservative. Repeat the name of it. It's called the Student Adult Liaison Committee. Yes, that was a new subcommittee. The students were flexible. That was when the issues arose whether the presidents were going to support the students' efforts uh, as opposed to letting the students run with their uh, portfolio, so to speak, and they were the system. And one incident, of course, which created this was when some Boyhouse students, or SNCC members, uh, held the Board of Trustees hostage at a meeting that they knew they were discussing these things because they didn't feel that they were going to come out with the right conclusion because the thing about it at that time among the adult black leaders and many other blacks, well, why don't these students leave the stuff alone? We're doing all right uh, or let the people, the big shots, so to speak, big shots being black people who whites recognized as so-called leaders of the black group. 
Sometimes they were leaders, sometimes they were house, I won't use the word, it's used in slavery. Sometimes they performed that way. And the students knew that. And they were determined they would have a part in what happened to Atlanta. And they won. They, they, they uh, published the uh, Appeal for Human, Committee for Human Rights, so forth. And uh, it, 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 had a, it had a destiny. Some people didn't want them to publish that after they saw the, uh, the content of it. They said, no, we can't. We can't. Let's do it our way. Let's do it like we used to do. Good when they hear that. And thankfully so. Yeah. I don't know if I answered yeah, the question. Yeah, that, that answers it. That um, leadership committee was not uh, student, uh, student adult liaison committee. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, he spoke. To, he speaks too long. You're trying to think of some. The student leader at that time. One of the student leaders at that time. Well, John Lewis, James Foreman, Lonnie King. You think of Lonnie King? Okay. That's what I'm yeah. I'm okay. Lonnie, Lonnie King was the pusher and the presumed leader of these groups. And uh, they mm -hmm. shifted and changed. They, they used his ability mm -hmm. to speak coherently mm -hmm. on these issues. It's not that everybody else was silent, but he, he, he became a leader. Mm -hmm. The students believed in him. And he convinced Dr. Mays to believe in him. Okay. And other presidents had no choice but to come on, come on and give so-called support. Mm -hmm. The support was not to interfere with the students' actions, even though they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So the liaison committee was a proven ground to get a consensus from mm -hmm. both sides. Mm -hmm. Both gave a little bit, gave a little bit, but it turned out fine. Okay. I just wanted to go back a little bit to the time before the students and the kind of leadership that was in the black community. And, of course, their strategies were different. Do you recall any of the older guard black leadership before the students came on the scene? <laughs> not, not that I respect it. There must have been some, but there was a group. Do you remember A.T. Walden? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember A.T. Walden. And he had done some tremendous things, I guess, but he, he wasn't going too far. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know what his attitude was at the time of the students, but uh, I suspect it was, uh, he slowed down a little bit, students, but let uh -huh. us handle this. Uh -huh. Let us handle this. We, we've done it before, we can handle it again. I suspect I, I may be saying wrong, and that it was no named group. It was popular preachers who felt the leadership urge, uh, like the Borders, like Reverend Borders, who I would say personally was for those students all the way. He had to convert the other people. That, that was the way to go. People like, I don't hate to call names, Scott, who was very friendly with him, knew him well, knew his family and all that. Uh, but he had a position that he knew, and I knew, that we were different. Different ideas. He was not particularly enthusiastic about the students marching in the streets or the sit-ins and so forth. And that was his right to have that, but that was the type of thinking generally that pervaded the adult community in Atlanta, Georgia, when the students hit the road and got together. But they were came, they came together, and uh, Martin Luther King was so afraid of that, and I hate to say this, of that type of culture. He didn't try to do anything in Atlanta. It was everywhere else. He didn't, he didn't want that fight. And his father was was a part of that also, but he was much more liberal, commonsensical than the people.
people who just said, now look, we, 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 got, a, we got a lot of fine in segregation. What, what's, what's wrong with that? And you know what? They were right. We got along fine economically under segregation, desegregation, because we weren't ready for it, and still not ready for it, but we're getting ready, was, was a damper on black economic uh, advancement. But it was time to get that out, even though we couldn't continue. And I'm saying the businesses that, that failed, that used to be prominent because they had a captive audience as a segregation, and all of those businesses did well under segregation. But the fact of segregation, that it had to go, we had to take the lumps with it. We didn't have any competition except with the other businesses in the black community. But desegregation, many didn't realize, meant that we had to mount up, we had to come up to compete in, in business and in the other issue. But that was part of the students understood that. They said, we can make it. Unfortunately, we have not retained that amount of thing, but we are getting there. We have more businesses uh, uh, interracially owned, and et cetera, and it's getting there. But we have the, the status, the economic status of blacks now is worse than it was in the days of segregation. Comparatively speaking, and you can understand that. It's a bigger playing field. And, and there's still less, I suppose. I don't know that the statistics were done that long ago. You see, what the black, there must be some, but I haven't studied them or reached them, but I would assume that the average black income under segregation was not comparable to the average white. Uh, associate business and so forth. So that's the way it is. So nobody's sorry that desegregation occurred, but very few were ready to accept, ready to work with it from an economic status mm -hmm. to maintain and enhance the freedoms that we had in the business world, so called. And, and it's getting better, but it's still a bad disparity between the average black business and the average white business. And, uh, say, uh, when people say now that black businesses can't expand except for a few of them because of the resources. Well, think about it. The blacks who are striving to have and create businesses now came from the people only centuries ago that had nothing but a bale of cotton to start with, whereas the white group had great resources at that time and they kept passing on the families down so they kept improving. But we started way behind. So I think it's Amazing to be complimented that black businesses have struggled from that low spot and are continuing to climb mm -hmm. in, 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 in importance and, and uh, involvement in, in the role of American economics. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned um, um, Mr. Scott yeah. of the Atlanta Daily World. And we know that at one point he, he, he was not really responsive to the student movement. And so then uh, the whole story of the uh, Atlanta Enquirer was an important story in the way in which the role it played in the movement. Can you, yeah, can let you me tell go back that story? That, I don't think I, when I, I know this is causing a problem before I read it yet, but it's coming. Uh, this is, uh, I want to talk about Mr. Scott again before I get into that. Then you, if I stray from the subject, give I'll me bring back. It back. To it. Mm -hmm. My comments were not meant to desecrate or devour Mr. Scott. He, he, he played a great role in the development of Black Atlanta and, and the country in, in his newspaper. I knew him 
when we lived in the Grand Georgia, which is 60 miles from here, I carried his paper. I go down to the and sold for eight cents a copy, the Atlanta Daily World. But I'd go down to the train station, and Mr. Scott would have sent me a roll of papers. And I'd pick them up. They got used to me coming down there on Thursday, I believe, and uh, put them out on Friday and Saturday in the Grange, riding a bicycle. He remembered that. When I moved to Atlanta, he said, I know your dad, and I know you. You, you deliver papers for me. I said, I'm glad you remembered that, Mr. Scott. I was I'm pleased. He said, oh, yeah, how come I forget that? And he was doing that all over Georgia, sending those papers to be delivered to black people. So they keep up with some news. So he was not a, what's a bad word, a pirate. He was not a bad man. Pariah. Mm -hmm. Pariah. He, he was not a pariah. He was with the issue. He just started out doing it a different way. That's all. He was far. All of these things the students were for. But given him, I've reached the age now that I could look down at students and say, I wonder why they're doing that. <laughs> because it doesn't appeal to me. And, and, uh, but it's, it's coming along. I want to say that before anybody says that you were dumping on Mr. Scott and praising him for his tenacity and for willingness to express his belief in spite of criticism, and he got a lot of it, mm -hmm. but not me. He didn't get a criticism for me, not that personal relationship. And, and his daughters, and, and uh, his daughters in the management that stays in the family are uh, doing an excellent job of keeping that paper going and keeping his destiny and, and, uh, going as not to suggest that they are not in tune. They are in tune mm -hmm. with the common black thinking now. And uh, there's no such criticism of, of the governance of that paper. Mm -hmm. No, I yes, I criticize. He knew he knew that. He knew Mr. Scott, he knew we were on a different level. But mm -hmm. I tell you the first I think I mentioned the first thing that I did was to work with him. Because mm -hmm. I just heard about it. It was in the paper or something, and the teachers were meeting under his supervision to, to see equal salaries. Mm -hmm. and I said, hey, don't tell me he's not a leader. Yeah, that was what I was going to ask you about. His, 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 one of the issues he was particularly interested in was the equalization, equalization of the teacher's pay. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I just, without invitation, but somebody's house had been in on the, over there, to, and I don't remember where. I went in, and just sat there and listened, and gave him some money that I didn't really could afford mm -hmm. to help move that project along, because mm -hmm. that's the way I felt. Yeah. What about the... Um, I lost the other half of the course. Well, that's all right. I'm getting ready to ask you. It's about the... Um, the development, the founding of the Atlanta Inquirer, how that came about. What is the story of the Atlanta Inquirer? The students needed a voice because at that time, Mr. Scott would not write favorably about the students' actions. That was his right. <coughs> they didn't hate him and didn't want to shoot him, but they needed an, an outlet to get their ideas out in the public and not having people say they shouldn't be doing this and been doing that and explain what they're doing and why. And that's how it, it grew. Uh, I'm a little confused as to whether it was simultaneous. I, I don't know. I think it was. Some people can give you better. And I know QB Williamson played a big part in that and called it together. The paper was formed. Jesse Hill, uh, uh, Herman Russell. Uh, and, but it's it was for the explicit reason to give the student voices could be heard in a press thing. And that's how it started out. And then it grew to just to be a black paper. And it is it's grown from those roots. Carl 
Holman was one of the, if it hadn't been for Carl Holton, it probably would have gone to his death. Carl Holton either left his job, I don't think he left his job with Clark University, but he, he assumed the editorship, which meant it was good, well done. Sheets where because I think it came out the first time out just in one sheet and I didn't acquire it. So. But it, it started growing from that point. I was involved in it. I remember investing $500 into it. I think a meeting at my home. I do an ad hoc meeting. Put the first check, well, one of the first checks, and other people put up five. Gave it to Jesse and them, you know, run, go, run with it. And uh, on the first issue, interesting story, we said, how are we going to get this paper out? We got three stacks of papers. <laughs> Just said, we're going to put them out. I said, I'm going with you. And we went up and down Simpson Road with a pack of papers just giving them away to the apartments and people on the street. And they, they spent some reasonable time out there doing that. From that, it grew to, to more like a typical newspaper, and I'm proud to say that when John Smith came on, and I have to, I'm going to take this credit, Jesse was uh, the chairman and president and ran everything, just you know, to, but he didn't run over the board because we knew, he knew what we wanted to cooperate. When, at one meeting, Coming out of it, discussing problems. I was on the board of trustees at the time of the paper. And discussing the problem coming out, one of them had to do with uh, how, how to secure uh, people, talented people, not necessarily educated people, but talented people who had abilities to help us run the paper. I walked out and what did I discover that one of my long-term friends, John Smith, was just, was, was just over there. He was just out there on the street of steps or something. And I rushed back in and said, Jesse, wait a minute, stay here a minute. And I went back out and brought John Smith in. He said, here's the man that you need to fill the spots that you're talking about. Well, I don't know him. I said, but I know him. And he's the man. What was his yeah. background? I, I plan yes, to interview him too. John Smith had been a, he, he was coming out of the army. Mm -hmm. His background is I knew him when he was this high in the grades. The families lived next door to each other. But his background was when he went to Boyle's College and he eventually finished and he came out of the army, took a job at one of the high school teaching mathematics at uh, Price. Price High School. Teach. Teaching mathematics. And he was doing that when I suggested him and pushed him into the Atlanta Inquirer. And just said, Who you hired? He said, we'll, we'll see. I said, Yeah, you'll see. And uh, he took off from there. He, he did both jobs adequately. He was the publisher, he, had a, he was in the management. And, uh, before I forget it, John has now been elected president and chairman of the AANP, American Association of Black Papers, over the world, over the United States. Back to the story. He worked hard. He didn't give up that job teaching for a long time. He did both of them. Mm -hmm. Circulation grew on his thing. That. Came down to the point we were doing pretty good and uh, had one board meeting. There were some problems coming up as usual. And I don't know where the item came from. But uh, everybody agreed to it to support it to sell it to John. Mm -hmm. Let him run it the way he wanted because he demonstrated he could do it. So that's what I was doing. But he kept on. They both pushed the paper forward. And uh, 
because that's his background. And right now he's somewhere doing something today to enhance the advancement of this paper right now. Well, now recently they celebrated yeah. their, their, was it the 45th anniversary of yeah. the paper? Yeah. Uh, you were at that celebration, did you? I was at both mm -hmm. places. I spoke at one of them, received an award at another one. Tell yeah, me about that award. A great, oh, just a typical award for your efforts or something. Beautiful. Uh, but uh, he asked me, as we were walking in the second one, is this the lady? He said, you say a few words. <laughs> but I did, and I think my wife was happy about it. And uh, this is the kind of relationship we have, had, and this is still have. I don't subscribe to the paper, but I do. But he, he puts one on my doorstep every time it comes out. Okay. Do you have the first copy, or some of the early copies? He of does. The, okay. He has an archives over there. Yeah, though. he has archives. He's running the business, just yeah. running as well as the AJC. Uh -huh. It's just smaller. Uh huh. That's all. Okay. Yes, he has archives. Yeah. Now the we son has joined him. Mm -hmm. And that's a big boost to the paper. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised at the, you know, how hard the people work on this paper to get it mm -hmm. It's not an easy job. Now, I know that the last time we did talk about the suit against Grady Hospital to desegregate Grady facilities, yeah. but I was wondering if first you could go into greater detail on what it was like medical care for blacks, uh, what it was like for black physicians in Atlanta, and then build up to yeah, that. Like suit said, I can give it three questions, I guess, one okay. until we get to that. What, what was it like for, for well, blacks as that, far as uh, health? Grady, Grady Hospital was obviously like everything else, completely segregated. The new Hughes-Spalding Hospital had just been built about a year or two old for blacks, separately. The black patients who had came with it was at one side of the hospital and the white people on the other side. I mean, physically divided. And that was the situation. The, the what was the difference in the facilities? They were in separate buildings. Were the conditions in those buildings different as well? Were, were the facilities for blacks as good that, as I those? I never went into the black side ah, of the radio okay. hospital. I never put my foot in. Mm -hmm. But I would suspect if everything was uh, like it was at that time, that it was probably inferiorly furnished. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that because I had a sister who died from lupus in 1950. She was only about 23 years old. <coughs> we were living in a grave, so I have put my foot. But the only place she could get cortisol was to every University of Grady Hospital. That's what the doctors advised her to get. My father was a, a school principal, but I don't know if you know him, but a rich school principal. He was you know, five or six thousand dollars a year. But he made sure that she got up here to the hospital. I left medical school coming out to visit her. She was in a black aspect. It was a separate building. And, and even to be then, that, that was all we could get. And it certainly wasn't equal. Let me put it that way. I think that's what you asked. I never got mm -hmm. to the white man. Mm -hmm. It wasn't equal, but it was adequate. Um, but I make the point that the stuff cost a thousand dollars a shot at that time. I don't know if my father did it, but she got her shot. And then they let it go. It wasn't a matter of going to a drugstore and getting it. It had to come through every and they were from sure. And then they released her. Mm -hmm. And she subsequently died. But not immediately. But uh, what was this? Well, like, what oh, was it like I, for I, you as a black physician? Oh, and well, other black me physicians? Either. I came in, you know, I'm fresh and out, and I'm, I'm somebody. You know, so I come in and start applying for. for hospital privileges at the White Hospitals. It didn't work. 
the only one that answered me, or two, really answered me by saying, why don't you just take your skills over to Houston Farmer, which we just built for you people. Eventually, I got the appointment as a, as a uh, back and forth, a instructor at every university, which meant I was supposed to take time out and, and go and teach students, in the, not teach them as a teacher, but just periodically meet with them and talk about cases and so forth. And that didn't work out because I was really ready to keep on doing it, take time out of it. Well, so I wasn't asked to leave that position. I kind of wanted to anyway. So it didn't work out. It put it that way. I don't know whether it's the student's reaction to a black person talking to him, but I wasn't the one who wanted one or two more. But then this, or maybe I just didn't do a good job. That's, that's maybe possible. This was in the 70s. Huh? This was in the 70s, wasn't it? 60s. Late 60s, early 70s. Like you would expect. Mm -hmm. was, everything was inferior for blacks. The one incident, I think I did this on another thing. Was, well, yeah, I know I did it. I'll do it again. During this controversy, a little story came out in the paper, AJC, where a white physician had slapped a black woman down in the treatment rooms. For his reason, she was obstinate. Or, a big controversy, but for a while, he led us to the editor and that sort of thing. Moved far and against it. Ended up, because I wrote one that they published, and they ended up debating the then dean of the Emory University School of Medicine, who really ran great on this issue at the YWCA, the Phyllis Wheatley, I think, the Marsh Brown was going over this before. And uh, drew a big crowd. And I think I won the debate. Where would your patients, if they needed hospitalization, Good. what would happen? I'd have to put them at either McClinton Hospital, Harris Hospital, Hugh Spaulding. That was it. Okay. What's the date for Hugh Spaulding? Hugh Spaulding was in the early, I can't remember if it was six, so. Somewhere in the, in the 50s, 50s yeah. early 50s, like 51, 52, or something like that. I think it's a couple of years old. Years, okay. you know, better. Somewhere in there. Right. The other hospitals, community hospitals, were run by, one run by a family group who was descendants of the founder, Harris Hospital, and McClinton Hospital, which was run by McClinton, Dr. McClinton. They both faded from the scenes. As they were fading from the scenes, we were beginning to get privileges at some of the White Hospitals. Otherwise, we wouldn't have anything but Hugh Spaulding. For a while there, we didn't have anything but Hugh Spaulding to put my patients in. But it was growing and moving all the time, the situation. And uh, my role was just, a, just a, I think I'm giving you a picture of what black physicians faced in. They couldn't go to the White Medical bees, we had our own organization, and we did well. Uh, but big training courses would come to town and want to go. You could, it finally got to you, could go to that, but you couldn't eat that. And you could go to downtown hotels, what they call professional membership or some not a complete membership. Well, I refused to take that. That could be a complete membership. Anyhow, as it turns out, the suit, my name was on it because they needed a physician. To talk to be so in my, that's how my name got involved. Whose whose idea was it to file this? I don't this know. Uh -huh. uh, 
but they, they approach the you. Students, it's part of the NAACP and, and under the auspices of Attorney Hollowell. Okay. I, I think that those records are available. I've seen them, but it, it suits itself with the list of people who are The interesting thing to me is that we'll get back to that about now. Is the black physician that was president at that time, I was the only one who was willing to sign it when I brought it to him. Say, we need to sign this along with the students. This is our thing. I don't want to get tied up into a lawsuit about the state of the So I went on sign it. And uh, then it, it, the suit was so good that every, the, the hospital just hadn't done it. They knew it was going to have to do it. The judge ruled without hearing the suit that you got to do this. These people are suing you for this. Everybody, you got to do this. It's a legal term, they didn't call it. So they did went on and got serious about desegregation and opened it up. Started taking applications and stuff. And uh, it grew from that. There are other instances where even though you were free, you were not free. I remember that one of the people on the suit was Ruby Doris Smith and her mother. How did that happen that they were parties of the suit? Ruby Dar Smith was also at first a student at Spelman. Right. That's how I met her. And I honestly never met her mother. I should have. But Ruby Doris went through some changes, but she was always uh, loyal to her group, the SNCC group, or whatever resulted from it. She got sick, and I went to see about her. She was living in a house not far from the Southwest Hospital on Fabric Road, as I remember. She had some sort of leukemia. And I, I don't know. She had doctors treating her. We just reviewed, dealt with her immediate problems. And those those specialists were blood specialists. I'm a surgeon, so. But I went down to see to do what I could do to help her. And uh, she ultimately died. And uh, she was one of the most vigorous. talented spokesman for the group, but, but she was quiet, unassuming. She wasn't looking for power or, or looking for fiction or paper. Mm -hmm. yeah, like I, a, yeah, I, I did know her. It was tragic, her death. I don't know her. Yeah. Um, when Martin Luther King uh, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, um, and so the opportunity to came to came up for him to be to be celebrated at a at a dinner. Um, can you tell me the story of yeah, what happened there know. and how what well, that I was like? I don't know what just happened. I don't know why I got an invitation and go. Uh, no, we went. It was done well at the... Was it Dinkler? Yeah. Dinkler Plaza. 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 That was the hotel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the event went fine. It, it was, there was no problems. And he gave a good speech. And people who spoke about it spoke well of him. And it was just a smooth event. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go best that. Particularly after I got the invitation. <laughs> and, and, uh, Do you recall? I, got, I don't know. Okay. Do you recall any of the other people that were there? Oh, yeah. The leaders, that Jesse Hill, Kevin Russell, the new leadership. Uh -huh. uh, some lawyers, Donald Hollowell, they were just, at that time, uh, mm -hmm. or, that's why I was surprised to get the invitation, prominent black people. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't prominent and I wasn't a leader. I was a participant. Mm -hmm. and so, and, uh, but yeah, it would describe what everybody, there was not a negative word spoken at that banquet. Mm -hmm. Or after, in the press. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't know what you want to do except it was a beautiful way to honor him. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was yeah. And I, I believe that who's you know, you know, I'm now, I'm now 
was his father, didn't was he? Yes. Uh, he was the one who put pressure on the whites. Right, along with uh, Robert Woodruff, because as I understand it, at first, the want, white business community really didn't want to support it. But Wood, once Wood, Woodruff said, got around it, support. then everybody. Now, that, now you're talking power. Yeah. Woodruff, that era. Uh huh. Woodruff ran the city like he wanted it to be. He wasn't particularly in favor of desegregation, but he didn't fight it, mm -hmm. as far as I knew. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you uh, about the election of 1961, where Ivan Allen was running against Muggsy Smith. Smith. Can you, do you recall any of that? I spoke to that before about my, his visit to my office, uh, soliciting funds. Which he didn't get. <laughs> and my interaction with him at another meeting while he was running, with which I was getting an award, he was the speaker. And several people get the award in different areas medical, medicine, journalism, whatever, teaching. There was one of them in medicine. And I met him again then, and uh, then I was a deal about the, the paper. And, but he, he has has and had my respect for being what was just said. The only Southerners, the first Southerners to go to Congress in the days of segregation, so we need to segregate. It's a big thing, no? mm -hmm. what somebody to do. It's an old day. I mean, they were a prominent business, good politician, how can you attack that? You can't beat that. Mm -hmm. He has everything to lose. Right. But he didn't care. So you supported Muggsy Smith as opposed to Ivan Allen. Got, got to say that. Okay. You're right, I'm glad. That's what I want to make very clear. Here we go again. Politically, we're naive. We were, we still are, as black people. <laughs> we were really naive that time. Black people sat out and uh, convinced me that Muggsy Smith was the best man because he was making better promises mm -hmm. for the advancement of black people, which we found out to be untrue later. But it, we, he sucked us in. Yes, I voted for Muggsy Smith against Ivan Allen because Ivan Allen had traveled the state uh, in spite of my king of these things. Right, but in the state, Pimp, we were there, we were there. Yeah. Well, he's running for mayor. Yeah. He ran for something else, but he was down and changed. He was a false segregation at that time. Mm -hmm. But this was for me. It was a different thing. Let me finish. Uh, ask me that question again. I'm going to make a note. About, yeah. well, just I was just interested but in what you recall of that election, yeah, because I understand yeah, that the students people, did we, support Smith. We had a, who, the student, didn't the students generally support Smith? Yeah, he said mm -hmm. just, I said we were politically naive, he uh -huh. came out and made some promises, we used to that, the white man said he's going to do so and so and so. Uh -huh. We had learned, he said that, but he's not going to do it. Uh -huh. to, to his, it's another way of expressing the value of Ivan Allen. He never, he never promised a whole lot for black people while he was running. He knew what he was doing. He mm -hmm. But that's a citywide race, yeah. But, yeah, but Mr. Smith lost. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness he did. Okay. Yeah. I know that many blacks voting. Oh, that was the, the Scott used to see that we were together at that time, we were voting. Most black people know anything about candidates and stuff. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But he would put out a list, he and the group. The Atlanta they Voters had to prove League. Uh -huh. That blacks should vote for. Most people take that list and just go to vote for. Uh -huh. And he was a good thing doing that. Nobody else was doing the Scott. He created that issue and, and kept it going. Atlanta voted, voted black voted rights organization or something well, like that. I think it was the Atlanta Voters, Voters League. League. Atlanta Negro Voters League. That's right. Yeah. Voters League. That's okay. 
Well, and now, that was a good thing. Uh -huh. Do you remember anything about Q.V. Williamson's election in 1965 as the first they, black I, alderman? I forgot who he ran, ran against. Because uh, I know that T.M. Alexander ran for that position subsequently mm -hmm. as a Republican. Which was not a bad thing in those days. It was a bad thing, though. No. <laughs> anyway, all I know, he ran. We voted and got him in the, in the city council. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a good one. Did you know him personally? Absolutely. Oh, okay. I told him he worked with the students and us and the paper and the, the whatever, the marches and stuff. Mm -hmm. He was supportive all the way. Mm -hmm. He was a good politician. He understood people. He knew how to talk to people. And he was well liked. I don't know. I'm trying to remember now that he got, that he died. He lost the office. I don't remember. But we were very proud of him and being elected. Mm -hmm. And he did a good job. Right. Were you involved at all in Julian Bond's election? To the House in the <coughs> 60s, around 65, I think it was. To the House, the State House, where he got uh -huh. put out because he spoke mm -hmm. against Vietnam. Right. No, I wasn't involved in the election. I don't think it, if it was. I had to be in heaven, voted for him. <coughs> I don't remember that vote, but I'm sure. If I voted, I voted for Jimmy Brown. He mm -hmm. won the seat. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently mm -hmm. got fired. He and subsequently they had to take it back. They, did, they didn't seat him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They didn't seat him until, I think, three yeah, elections well, later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you, you really have to write a lot of stories in the Atlanta, in the Atlanta Inquirer. Uh -huh. At one point, he was the editor at one point, come to think of a student. Mm -hmm. But he knew how to write. Mm -hmm. And I always observed and I noticed that he was so quiet in those meetings. He, he was just listening. Mm -hmm. It's just like me just walking to a meeting and start telling everybody what to do and how to do it. He he was he was absorbent mm -hmm. and he blossomed out into his real strength. Mm -hmm. He's one of my favorite people. Mm -hmm. Okay, about now forty years later, this is, we're running toward the end of the interview, and I wanted to know what you felt about the gains and losses of the civil rights movement. Where are we now? The gains. Gains were perfect. They opened doors and we rushed into them. We didn't hesitate. We said, We have trouble with black people. Then we found out there were other doors in there blocking us too. We get a job and we just be put up front in a room like this. So business people coming in could see, Well, this is a good company. They have black people, but I was the only one. And those things like that. So, but it was an opening anyway. Nobody needed to criticize. That was progress and it was open. Um, so what did we gain? Well, we, what we did gain and were gaining is being slowly slipped away. The advantages, I don't call it advantages, I call it affirmative action that should be to help lesser groups get equal with other groups. But you know that has a bad name. Uh, unfortunately, many black people don't think that affirmative action is proper. I cannot understand it. They think it. They don't understand the word. They've been, they've been uh, scared. What does Fox News do? Uh, spin. They've been, they've been spin by people to say that, including Clarence Thomas in the Supreme Court, that affirmative action is bad. How is it bad? What you've had all your life, all our lives, is white affirmative action. That's what the situation was, white affirmative action. Now we try to get equal, and you call it black affirmative action, and you want to dump on it. No, no, you don't need that. Whites have had affirmative action ever since this country was founded. They tell me, what's wrong with affirmative action to help? The minorities. Let me, let me spread it out a little bit. Not just say blacks. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing is wrong with that. But people can 
spin it. Said, what about the whites? They replace it. But they had affirmative action all this time. It's time for them little. Go, don't don't start me on this. Uh, that's the most. That's that's where we are now. We have. I wrote a piece for myself a couple of days ago. We have house slaves in this government. They're the same as I hate to use the term as the house slaves and slavery, who kept their privileges of eating in the house and lived there that they received as house slaves by supplying Master with any problems to make be happening out here. And Master could, could deal with it because he knew about it in advance. Our politicians are doing the same thing. For the sake of being reelected or being reappointed to something, or keeping a good job, they were running to the Republican Party, which now has no love for affirmative action. They have spent the rest of the country to start thinking that way, except for isolated areas and spots in this country, the isolated writers who are not buying that. that we don't, we not hurt white people when we ask for affirmative action. We don't ask for money anyway. Just affirmative action to help what we are doing now get a little better. To guarantee success but help them. Help the businesses, help the schools, the things that we've called our own in the black community. And help us come along, because we're the integration that to help that. The defeat is to harm it. It's harm black colleges. It used to be all black. It was, uh, but we have to live up to it. We have to get to it. And we need that affirmative action step. And I, I can't. I, I don't like to call these, but house slaves is the only way I can term it to give the relationship. There must be a better word for it. <laughs> but uh, uh, the political situation now is that you far further the facts, you're not going anywhere. You're not going to involve in this political situation. So if you wish to get somewhere, you, you will say, well, we'll get some further action. And I think that's a sellout. And it fell out of integrity of the politicians and the big shots who go that way. Because many of them do. I understand they got to support their families. Well, they had to support their families in the slavery, in the desegregation. Now we're into a different phase. Okay. Do you have any other comments you'd like to make? Uh, about I don't know why I'm, general like era. To, I don't know why I'm here, so I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to do my spin. <laughs> well, listen, the pleasure is all mine, all ours. We're we're glad to have you, and and thank you for coming both times to to share with I mean, us. I want to give you a couple of bottles and I try to live back. I'm an American. Call me and say you will. In spite of what I've said about this, I'm still an American. Definitely. Been. And for truth, justice, equality, and freedom. That's, that's me. You got me. I don't need to say. Thank you very much for sharing all Thank of this you. with us. Thank you. I'm sorry. Why are you so?